Have you ever been faced with the daunting realization that you were wrong about the world? Wrong about the way things are? Wrong about why they're that way? A few blocks from my house, I came to an intersection where I always turn right, but decided to take a left. I was surprised at how different this neighborhood looked, and it was less than a mile from my house. I noticed little details that raised questions in my mind, like, why is this man just sitting there at 7.30 in the morning drinking? Is he one of those people you hear about who'd rather live off of food stamps than work at a job? And what about these kids? Shouldn't they be getting ready for school? Don't their parents care enough to tell them not to play in the street? How do these people live like this? Where's their self-respect? And what about this kid? Where are his parents? What chance does he have growing up in a place like this? Most of the people I'd seen in this neighborhood started out just like him. And this thought began to chip away at my assumptions. Maybe I was wrong. Something about that experience clung to me and I began to run through that neighborhood almost every day. I found out that the man I had seen works third shift every night, but he still can't afford to cool his old drafty house. So he sits outside on his front steps and tries to cool down with a cold beer. He hasn't seen his daughter in two weeks. She's supposed to stay with him on weekends, but she keeps canceling. And as for the kids playing in the street, their mom has to take three different buses to get to her first job. And by the time she gets home from her second job, it's already dark outside. Before I knew it, the curiosity that kept bringing me back to this neighborhood had turned to anger. I was angry at the dad who wasn't there for those kids. I was angry at the crummy little convenience store on the corner that charged twice as much for groceries as a store that I drove to. I was angry at all the systems that were supposed to help these people, but were only driving them deeper into dependence. But most of all, I was angry at myself. These were my neighbors. Stopping to talk with people, I've learned a lot. I found there were people moving into these neighborhoods to simply be good neighbors. Many are developing innovative solutions empowering people to better their own circumstances. Businesses, nonprofits, and churches are beginning to partner with neighborhoods to develop whole communities. They say isolation is what allows poverty to sustain its forceful grip in neighborhoods like this. The more I look around, the more hope I found in others trying to break through the isolation. It's not something that happens overnight, but it is happening. You ever been in a car ride driving? Not knowing where you're going, kids are yelling in the back, where are we going, where are we going? Left. Where are we going, dad? I don't... You know, as parents, you know you don't know where you're going. It's like, man, I'm just going, I'm, I'm going to turn another, take another left right here. Before you know it, you end up 
maybe at a park. I'm getting tired. <laughs> you end up somewhere that you, you, you weren't expecting, somewhere you've never been before. I love this video because it talks about the power of turning left. You ever normally go right, but you decide to turn left? You get curious about something, and so you try to go figure out, man, what's, what's around this, this corner? And you figure out that what you thought you knew wasn't what you saw. Let me ask you this question. Who are the most curious people in the world? I'm going to ask that question one more time. It's not a trick question. Who are the most curious people in the world? Neighbors. Who got a curious neighbor? Always peeking over the fence. We were outside doing a yard work the other day, and this one little girl, she's always looking through the fence, trying to, Juliana, Juliana. She's always out there yelling for Juliana. How many people know that kids are some of the most curious people in the world? Kids are just born curious. I don't know if you've been around any children lately. I wasn't even planning this, but I got one of my children right here, our nine-month-old. Nine Say, what's up, girl? She's so happy. This girl's curious. She was born curious. She, she just started to crawl recently. And so she's crawling around the house. Look at that. She can hold her food in her hand, which is amazing. Well, let me get that in there. She's crawling around the house, and one of the things, it's amazing how kids are always drawn to those things that they shouldn't be drawn to. So we're constantly pulling her off of the edge of the stairs where she's getting ready to tumble over. We're constantly pulling her away from the uh, outlet that she's getting ready to uh, stick her uh, finger in. We're constantly pulling her away from these things, but, but, but she is born with this curiosity. Let me ask this question. Who are the least curious people in the world? Look at the person sitting next to you and say, you are? I, I don't know if you've recognized this, but kids, kids are born with this level of curiosity and they haven't been through a lot and so they're going through life, man. They're touching stuff, they're licking stuff, they're doing a lot of things to a lot of stuff to just try to figure out what it is. And as we get older, we have all these experiences that cause us to just want to sit in our chair. We get a lot less curious about things, a lot less curious about life. We say, man, I've been there, done that, ain't trying to do it again. I've taken a left one too many times in my life. You know what? I'm content with just sitting in my chair because I know what's going to happen right here. I know who's going to sit right next to me. I know what angle I'm going to be able to see from. As adults, sometimes we start to lose the curiosity that helped us get to where we are. And this picture or this video paints such a powerful illustration about the power of curiosity. There's a definition I want us to look at of curiosity. It says the intense desire to understand. The intense desire to understand. I hate to say this, but did you know as church people, as people of faith, we are known as people who, 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 who aren't very willing to understand other people's perspective? A lot of times we're more worried about being understood than we are trying to understand what somebody else is going through. Christianity hinges on this basis of being curious. Being curious. Curious about people. Curious about communities. Curious about our city. When we stop being curious, we stop living for Christ. Jesus was one of the most curious people in the world. He was always interested in hearing about and learning about other people's story. And there's a story in Scripture. Luke 
chapter 10. I feel like I'm always reading this story and talking about this story, but did you know that uh, in a couple of weeks we're going to talk about this more, but there are two, uh, there's the great commandment and the great commission, the, 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 these two big ideas that the entire Bible hinges around. The great commission is to go into all the world and make disciples. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor, even the super curious ones, as you love yourself. The two most important things in Scripture, and so if there's anything we can do as a church, it's to build our lives around these two big ideas. And so in this story, there was a, a religious guy, a guy who knew all about Scripture, knew all about what the Bible said, and he asked Jesus the question, who, who's my neighbor? And the Bible says that he wanted to justify his actions because what he knew and the way he was living, there was a gap. Can I ask you guys a question? Has there ever been a gap between what you know and what you do? Only three of us live in that gap. There's been a gap between what we know and what we do that's called being human, but we can always take steps to close that gap. And so, well, we see this story in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus uh, paints this picture, and I got kind of inspired by Pastor Todd last week. How many people enjoyed Pastor Todd last week from Calvary? I got inspired by Pastor Todd, and so I need, four, I need four people to come help me. Four defensive linemen. No, I'm just kidding. Just four people. I need four people to come help me. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Four people. Come on. I know you were up last week. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Yep. Come on. Oh, yeah. Got a good-looking four people. Come on, Mike. All right. We just need four. All right. Just come on up. We'll take five. We're going to rewrite this story a little bit. All right, this is what I need. I need, how about you four to kind of stand over in this area right here. All right, you four stand over here. All right, Mike did it, everyone. So in this, in this story, we see that there was a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. That's Mike. Let's start over here. Jerusalem's over here. Jericho's over there. We got this Jewish man traveling over here from Jerusalem to Jericho. Come on, Mike. Hey, hey, we might need to do that one again. Mike's going from West Omaha to North Omaha, and he gets attacked. Just one, just one. He gets attacked by a guy in a Better Together shirt. Please, 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 if you attack somebody, just take off the shirt. <laughs> he gets attacked. He gets beaten up. Well, have him sit down right there. Mike, Mike, go ahead and sit down. You can exit stage left. We don't put up with fighters. No, I'm just kidding. He gets attacked by bandits. So, so it says that they stripped him of his clothes. We're not going to do that one up here. Beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. So Mike is sitting here, man, he's hurting, he's struggling, he's, he's left to the side. Look, he, he just looks bad, doesn't he? He looks all beaten up. It says, by chance, a priest came along. This is our priest. You got to walk like a priest. It says, a priest came along, but he saw the man lying there. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Come on, priest. Come on, priest. Man, you tell people about Jesus. You, you, you know all the scripture. Yeah, that's what the scripture say. Keep on walking. He was feeling bad. You, you doing it right. You doing it right. But I mean, let's be honest. Come on, priest. You got, hey. The priest, for sure, you got your better together t-shirt on. You know the law. You know the scripture. You see this guy hurting, but the scripture says that he passed by and went to the other side. We got our temple assistant who's walking over. The temple assistant works right along. The priest helps out at the church, knows what's going on. It says that 
She looked at him lying there, but she also passed over to the other side. How many of us in here today, you saw somebody lying there hurting, needing help, how many would pass by? Be honest. We all need to repent right now of our sin <laughs> of lying. How many people passed by somebody on the way to church today? It says, the temple assistant walked over, looked at him, passed by, but, next verse, it says, a despised Samaritan came along. Now, this is so interesting because as the despised Samaritan comes along, this is the person that's least likely to help somebody like Mike who's in trouble. Least likely. Knows the least about the scriptures and the laws and the great commandment and the great commission. Knows the least. It says, when she saw him. Go ahead, Samaritan, take your time. <laughs> when she saw him, she felt compassion. Going over to him, she soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them up, then put the man <laughs> on her donkey and took him to the inn where he could, uh, get, he, he could get more help and take care of him. Come on. Thank you guys so much. Hey, can we give it up for our incredible actors? Thanks, brother. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. I mean, could you imagine the two who knew the most about Scripture, the two who were the most church, if you took a poll of who was at church the most, it was the first two. They hadn't missed a Sunday in years. They were actually the ones putting on the Sunday morning celebration. The people who knew the most did the least. See, it's not, it's not enough for us to know a bunch about God. It's not enough for us to just show up at church every Sunday. It's not enough for us as we get older, the older we get maybe the more knowledge we have and the more understanding and the more information we have. This scripture, Jesus was trying to paint a picture that it's not enough to just know. The person who knew the least sees this person in trouble and has a level of curiosity to want to learn and understand and know what's going on. Instead of the opposite of curiosity is this idea of just going through my day at, like things are normal, not wanting to be interrupted. And so instead of Instead of the other two, they, they didn't want to be interrupted. They kept going. This, this Samaritan comes and says, man, I'm willing to try to understand where this person is at. I'm curious, why is this person on the ground bleeding in the first place? Was it their choice? How'd they end up here? That curiosity led the Samaritan to have compassion. That compassion ultimately led to that Samaritan taking action. And the reason curiosity is so powerful is because it leads us somewhere. Curiosity, when, when we say, you know what, it's not enough to know about the statistics in my city. It's not enough to know about how people are living. I've got to find out more about it so I can maybe be a part of the solution. And that curiosity leads to God filling us with a level of compassion where we say, you know what, I've got to take action. I can't stay in this boat any longer. I can't just show up. I've got to get curious. I love how God works. Sometimes it's pretty humorous to me. God put me in a position yesterday morning similar to this individual who, Jewish man who got beaten up. I had a full day of yard work. Anybody do yard work yesterday? Full day of yard work and I got a bunch of trees and stuff and had people coming over to help. Thank you Jesus for help in the yard. I, I, I just believe and pray God's going to give those who showed up a double anointing. 
but I had a full day of yard work, so I rented this, this chipper, and I needed a truck to pull it, and so I, I, I get a truck, and, and I go to this rental shop, and I get this chipper, and, and I hook this chipper up to the back of the truck, and the truck was missing one little piece. On the hitch, there's a pin that holds the hitch in. And so I had the pin, but there's another little piece that you put on the edge of the pin to make sure that the pin stays in. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever done this before? Well, I didn't have the piece that goes on the edge of the pin. It was my brother-in-law's, and so I uh, made an assumption that the tension would hold the hitch in position. Bad assumption. And so I'm driving, and, and, and I get to an intersection, and I pull up, and it's a red light, and I'm kind of a little bit on an incline, and I pull up on an incline, and next thing I feel is the, uh, uh, the, the chipper unhooks from the back of the truck. Luckily, I had the chains on. Holla at your boy. The chains work. The chains held it, but then it comes forward and hits the back of my truck. I'm driving on the phone with my wife. I said, I got to go. She's like, oh my goodness, what's the matter? Is he going to die? I jump out. I go outside. You've got the hitch hooked onto the top of the chipper, which is laying on the front of the ground. I got the truck in park. Light turns green. I'm out there. I'm trying to lift this chipper up by myself, put it on, put a piece on the side. Can't do it. Call my wife back. I said, I need, I need you to get me something and try to tell her what it is. And she had no clue what I was talking about. I was probably mumbling, fumbling. I'm like, I'm, I'm in the middle of this intersection. I got this going on. And I'm out there. I try to put a piece in place. And I'm trying to get real strategic. I go find a few things in the truck to put it behind the wheels of the chipper so it doesn't roll backwards into the next view. I'm sitting there trying to, I'm trying to pull this thing up. And I cannot do it. And people are driving by me. In Better Together shirts. I swear at least one of them had a Better Together shirt on. I was praying I would see you today. Pray for you. I'm there struggling, and this guy pulls up. It was an angel in the form of a black swole dude with a big old truck and a hitch on the back. And he pulls up and pulls off to the side, and first he blocks the other side, then he pulls in. He says, man, let me help you. Anybody know this guy, by the way? Keith? He pulls over. He gets out. He, he helps me lift this thing up. We get it set right. I'm still waiting for this piece. I don't have this piece. He says, man, let me hook it up to the back of, the tr of my truck so we can get it out of the way. And so he hooks it up to the back of his truck. We pull it off to the street. I'm running over there to go meet him over there. And then another guy in a white truck pulls by. He says, hey, man, what you need? I was like, oh, I'm just trying to figure this thing out over here. He said, no, no, man. He said, I've been to Bridge Church before. I said, thank you, Jesus. He takes off his hitch. He got a hitch. He gives me his pen and the piece I need. In a matter of about 10 to 15 minutes, I go from like in serious crisis mode to somebody stopping, taking the time to help me out in this place of need while people I guarantee are driving by judging me. <laughs> How'd that brother get in that position? They would be right to judge me. But they're driving by judging, and I can tell you what, him stopping and helping me was literally an angel from God. My wife here in the story couldn't believe that 15 minutes later, I'm headed back home and we had the time of our life chipping all that wood. <laughs> My man Keith, afterwards, we start talking. He said he was in the joint for like 10 years. His life's been radically changed. I told him I was a part of a church. He said, man, I got a testimony. He, he's telling me what he's doing with his life and sharing his testimony. I said, man, this ain't no accident that God connected us, that you stopped here and helped me. He said, well, I just need you to do one thing. I said, what's that? He said, give me a review on Facebook. 
I said, I don't have Facebook. But if you have Facebook, <laughs> give Keith and Sons a review. And if you want your car detailed, I'm going to get mine detailed. I want you to get your car detailed by Keith and Sons. And we're going to flood him with the love of Jesus. Can I tell you, the other guy who pulled over in the truck, he said, man, I ain't been to church in a while. I said, man, it's not an accident that we ran into each other. I said, come on back. He said, I'll be back. It's amazing how God can use that inconvenience in my life, but people who, who are curious enough to want to be a part of the solution, can I tell you, it made the difference in my day. It made the difference in my life for what was going on at the time. Can I tell you this morning, I sit down next to somebody at our church, and I say, how you doing? And they say, not very good. And I sit there and I listen to the reality of their life and the reality of the circumstances that they're, that they're living in and all the things that are going on, and, and my heart is breaking. And even during tip time, I had to go off to the side because I was just getting emotional about what was happening. Can I tell you that just how are you doing and living with a level of curiosity versus just showing up on a Sunday morning but saying, man, I want to know how somebody else is doing because maybe God will fill me with compassion and I can be a part of the solution by taking action. Can I tell you when we're when we're curious enough to understand and, 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 and see and hear what other people are going through, God uses it in a powerful way. The worst thing we can do is say, man, I'm a Christian. I've made my decision. I'm sitting in my chair. I'm not willing to get out of my box. It's uncomfortable. It's going to cost you. But I'm so glad they were willing to inconvenience themselves and take a few extra moments to be a part of the solution that I needed. See, in this story, Jesus goes to great lengths to help us understand what love really looks like. Love looks like taking action. Love looks like being curious enough to understand the brokenness. I love, I was, I was talking to Pastor Rob recently. And God's been doing something in Pastor Rob's heart, and he says, you know, there, there, there's something about the homeless in our city. How many people know we got homeless people in our city? How many people know we have homeless people in our church right now? And, and God's been uh, giving Pastor Rob just kind of this heart, and I love what Rob has been doing. He said, man, I've been spending some of my extra time, and I've just been driving to where they're at. And I've been trying to just be around them and learn from them and understand them. And God has been giving Pastor Rob a, 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 a compassion for them in a way. He said, man, I, I just didn't even, I didn't even realize that this whole world existed over here. There are people in our church that we've got to become curious about. You don't know who you're sitting next to. Can I tell you that? You don't know the story of the person next to you until you take the time to ask them, man, how are you doing? Tell me about your life. Number two, there are opportunities all over our city where as a church, we can be the solution. We can be a part of getting in the game in such a way that our city doesn't have to look the same. And I'm passionate because we've got organizations and individuals in our church who are a part of, of, of the solution in different ways. And my heart would be as a church, we could rally around those people to say, you know what? I'm busy, but I got a little time to be a little curious. I'm not even asking you to sell your house, give all your money away, move into a community. I'm just saying, let's just get a little curious. Let's just find out what's out there. Let's just go visit some people and visit some places and and see what we find out. We got some people at our church, I want to invite them up here, who are a part of several different organizations. And I wanted to just give them a moment to share 
so that as a church, we could have even a greater understanding of some of the opportunities that are out there. And I want to encourage us. Let's get curious. Let's find out. I believe afterwards they, they've got some information that we'll share with them uh, or that, that, that you can learn more about what they're doing at the Welcome Center in the back. But I want to take a few minutes and just kind of have them share a little bit about what they're doing and maybe a simple step that we can take to get involved. How you guys doing today? Awesome. Come on. I'm going to have us start with Miss Vicky, and I'm just going to have you introduce yourself and then just briefly talk about the work that you are a part of and just why you're so passionate about it. Good morning, Bridge Church. Good morning. Um, Good morning. My name is Vicki Quates Ferris. I'm the Director of Operations for the Empowerment Network. And um, our mission basically is to work with residents, um, elected officials, the law enforcement, businesses, you name it, to really transform the economic conditions and the quality of life for African Americans, for those who live in North Omaha, and then for the greater Omaha area. And um, we feel that irregardless of where your zip code is located at, you should really have the opportunity to experience the vitality and everything that goes with um, having, you know, whatever it is that you want, um, to be able to have access to that. And so we've got a number of things that we do, but I would say, the two top things that we have going on is, one is the summer youth employment program that we have going on right now, and then the other is really the violence intervention prevention piece. And so we really work with um, how do we reduce crime and violence, and whether you know it or not, it is being reduced. And in terms of the employment program, there were a number of things happening in North Omaha in terms of the violence. There was, in one month, over 30 shootings uh, in one month, 30th and Parker, if you know where that's located, it was one of the deadliest corners in North Omaha, and now you see what's called 75 North that is there, but really it's empowering residents and empowering the community. It's not about a hands, you know, giving somebody something, it's what can you do first for yourself? Yeah. And then when they've done all that they can, then you bring in those resources. Come on, come on. How many people believe that your zip code should not determine your life? Good. And that everybody should have an equal opportunity to reach their God-given potential. How many people know that right now our zip codes are more uh, dividing us than uniting us? Yeah. And there's areas in our city that are highlighted. Just on the, the, this is more on the diversity side of things, but my wife was reading an article the other day, a national article, and you can go to your city and find out what your city looks like when it comes to diversity. Did you know we live in one of the most segregated cities in the country? It should be. Bridge Church is here. It should be. We're a part of the solution. I just want to say, too, one thing that highlighted this idea to me so much, Vicki, was when we started our basketball program several years ago. And, and I remember we went to OSA, and we were playing in a third grade league. And we were playing against a team. We got beat 40 to 2. Lord was working on my humility. But when we were leaving the game, I recognized every kid on our team, it's the third grade, but it had been their first basketball team. We picked up every kid in the van. Every other kid on the other team had a parent. Every other kid on the other team had a basketball that they came with and a hoop to go home and practice, and none of our kids had that same opportunity. And so you talk about the disparity, but I love Vicki and, and, and her team, Willie. They've been at this for how many years now? Uh, since, since 2008. Since 2008. Well, actually, I would say since 2006, but officially about 2008. 2008. And you've been doing that in so many different ways. So great job. Thank you so much. Come on. How about, well, let's have uh, Miss Shelly Poole from the street school. Come on. We do love North Omaha. So if you go out any of the doors that you came in and you take that left turn, you will end up at the street Come school. Come on. Just saying. So the Omaha Street School is moving into our 20th year wow. next fall. Wow. We are a private alternative school. And what makes us most different is that we love Jesus. Come on. And we're able to introduce our kids to opportunities that they've never seen before or that no one's been around to help support them. So we help our kids find hope. 
And <laughs> once you have hope, you are empowered to do anything. Come on, Mom. So every success looks different. Mm -hmm. Yes, graduation might be a success, but you know what? When I have a kid that only went to school 20 days last semester, and they've been to school 95% of this semester, mm. that's huge success. Come on. Yep. Yeah, come on. Yep. So success looks different for everyone, and we celebrate that with our kids, and we celebrate those small steps. Um, with the Omaha Street School Ways to Get Involved, we, uh, most of our funding takes care of our operations, having to pay teachers um, and those things, so donations are how we survive with everything else. Mm. And ways to get involved with that, not just money, praying for my staff, praying for my kids, sending notes. Everybody can write a note. Um, we can give you a kid's name and you can pray for them and send notes to them. You can come and support them at our quarterly awards because there's more to success than grades. Yes, yes. Um, we have volunteers for 20 years who have brought lunch to us every day. Come on, come on. So we are known for our lunches. So those are individuals, couples, churches, um, businesses, send different groups that take a day every month and provide lunch for us. Um, supplies for breakfast, the kids do their own breakfast and we're just down there hanging with them, helping them start the day. We have no custodial service, so there's all kinds of volunteering opportunities for that. And sometimes just coming and sitting in a classroom, yep. like modeling what a student looks like, asking questions as if you're a student. Sometimes it's just coming and visiting a kid that you connect with, or if you know somebody that comes to the street school. We are absolutely, our doors are open for you to come and visit them, hang with them, pray with them. We're always looking for chapel speakers every week. We bring in people from the community to share their stories and their testimonies um, so kids can see how God's impacted them and, and how different that can look and that nobody has the same story. Yes. And so just validating our kids, validating their families, um, that makes us very different in terms of our holistic view is, we let the kids know when they enroll that Miss Poole is up in your business. And if I have students here, which I might, they will attest to that. Because how can we help you be successful if we don't know what's going on in your lives and what is your heart and they will trust us and we're not done with them when they leave us. We can, I've got kids that are 30 that wow. still come back or still wow. text or still wanna know what's going on. on. So come on. love what we do. Come on. Any, any students here today? Like, man, if I am, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> I remember being one of those students. Come so on. powerful. Come and we've, we've seen lives that have been changed yeah. through what you guys are doing. And not all of us are called to uh, be there with the students every single day, but we can support in different ways. And I'm so thankful for you and, and mm -hmm. teachers that have responded with a yes in your heart mm -hmm. and spend that time there. I actually got a text from a guy the, the other day. He said, hey, I'm gonna be on campus. Serving at the street school. Come on. So, good job. Come on, Shelly. Come on. Powerful. Yeah. Love it. I, good morning, I'll just bro. say this before Joey shares. Chris Harrell from the Hope Center. We've yeah. got some Hope Center. Any, any Hope Center people in here? Come on. We got a few people at the Hope Center. Chris was going to share today. And then uh, God called him away to run the half marathon in Lincoln this morning. <laughs> God really didn't call him away. That was a joke. But uh, that's where he's at this morning. But the Hope Center is another great opportunity uh, for us to be a part. Yep. Good morning, Bridge Church. How are you guys feeling this morning? Come on. Incredible leaders in our community. My name is Joey. Um, I serve here as one of the pastors, and it's an, honestly an honor uh, to serve you guys. But I'm also representing Abide. And I've heard many people say, what's the difference between Abide and Bridge? <laughs> um, but honestly, it's honestly been a beautiful partnership of two organizations for a very long time. Yes. Um, I really don't think you can understand fully bridge or abide without understanding kind of the history of how we got started. 25 plus years ago, the Dotzler family came into North Omaha, started a nonprofit called Abide. And they had a vision to see a different inner city. They had a vision to see a different community here in North Omaha. And so out of that, actually, Bridge Church was birthed. Yep. Fifteen years later, Bridge Church came out of that. Um, but to this day, we actually operate together. We operate as two different organizations, but we're partnered together in a vision to see a different inner city. We have a vision to see a, a different culture. We envision to see a culture much like you see like what we're experiencing right now in all 700 neighborhoods of North Omaha. 
And so we really have a holistic approach at Abide to see uh, our inner city change. Really, there's four main components to this transformation. The first one is family support programs. We have what's called Better Together Basketball. Anybody a part of that? Come on. Come on, make some noise. An incredible program to really support families in the community and to get kids off the streets and get them onto this campus. And so uh, that, that's really kind of the first main component. The second component uh, is community building. Who was at the Easter egg hunt a few months ago? Who was there? Incredible opportunity. But we had about 1,300 people here in this gym, but we were really building community because we believe when the community is together here in North Omaha, our environments are safer. We also have what's called Second Saturday Serve. Who's been a part of Second Saturday Serve here? Make some noise. I know that's built into the rhythm of what we do here at Bridge Church, but we really believe as we get out of the seats together as a city, we are beautifying our neighborhoods, we are loving, we are building community, and we're building a better community here in North Omaha. And so really the third main component of Abide is neighborhoods or housing, and there's, that's where we have our Lighthouse program. Anybody a Lighthouse leader in here? Come on, make some noise. A Lighthouse leader is really a family and a hope advocate who lives in the community here. We have a vision to see 700 hope advocates or families living all across North Omaha. They're building community in the neighborhoods, they're having block parties, they're cleaning up the neighborhood, but they're really instilling a hope-filled culture here in our community. It's been proven and the police have proven that when a lighthouse exists in a neighborhood, crime drops 70%. And so we really believe that when we get into the neighborhood, things completely change. Uh, me and my wife are lighthouse leaders on 40th Ave and Grant. And I have literally seen with my own eyes, when people just get into their neighborhood, love their neighbors, things start to change. Yes. Just even the other night, we had a... We were just hanging out, throwing the football, playing basketball. All of a sudden, there's like 50 kids in our neighborhood. It's a block party. I didn't know it was a block party, but it turned into one. And so we really believe that in order to change our community, in order to build a, a kingdom culture like what you see this morning, we have to get into the neighborhoods. And then the fourth piece is partnerships. We have a vision to see all of Omaha involved in Come what on. we're doing here in, in North Omaha. Come and on, so, so excited. You all are a part of that. and just excited what God is doing. So. Come on. I just love how there's one vision, and it's God's vision, and it's to see lives changed. It's to see our communities revitalized, and we all get to be a part of it in some way. I want to encourage you, get curious, learn more. They'll be out the Welcome Center with more information, but can we make some noise for these individuals who have given their lives to see the kingdom of God advance? Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I cannot understate it enough. There is power in curiosity. Power in taking the time to understand. Not just being so worried about being understood. Power in, man, when you have one of those thoughts. Man, I wonder how this happened over here. I wonder what happened over here. I'm telling you, our organization is a representation of somebody who just, God started to work on their heart, they got curious, made a decision, and ended up moving into a community. Every single person on our staff and our team, I think of the decisions that have been made. I think of the stories in this room. How many people came to Bridge just because you were curious about what's going on? Man, there's something happening. I gotta go check it out. We want to be the type of people that are willing to move beyond ourselves so that God can fill us with this compassion and lead us into a place of action. How many people would say, man, I, I got to get curious. I got to get curious. I got to get uncomfortable. I got to turn left. Just turn left. Look at the person next to you say, just turn left. Just turn left. Turn left, turn left. Let me pray. God, thank you so much. 
Lord, I pray that we would be the type of people that don't get too comfortable in our bubble, too comfortable in our, our own kind of position. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to get outside of ourselves to find out about the person we're sitting next to. God, find out about the community that we're right down the street from. God, find out about some of the hopelessness that's happening so that we can be carriers of hope and be a part of the solution. Lord, I pray that even today you would ignite our hearts, ignite our hearts to take action. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. If you believe at Bridge Church, say turn left. Say turn left. Turn left, turn left.